Good morning, everyone. Uh, I want to make a, a number of uh, announcements um, and uh, per needs. I uh, want to let all of you know um, that Amanda's sister, um, Gretchen, passed away on Friday. So be praying for Amanda. Amanda and Paul are even thinking of going all the way down to Texas for the funeral, so I'm not sure how that's all going to work out. Uh, but uh, just pray for the whole family. Um, and then uh, Kenny did have surgery. The plate was removed, and um, the bone had healed really well uh, from his eye. So um, now we just need to continue to pray that uh, by removing the plate, which they weren't planning to remove at this time, but there was problems with it, by removing the plate, that, that it will heal um, for him. And then uh, Becky and Harold are doing a little better as we prayed uh, for them. Um, if you are on the prayer list, uh, they have both have COVID. Um, Harold's been having a hard time sleeping, um, has found that if he sleeps on the couch and within, in an elevated position, um, he'll get some rest. So uh, continue to pray, particularly for Harold. Um, Becky and I have been back and forth and she was doing a lot better. Um, and then uh, we do have another date for Vera's surgery on uh, uh, October 3rd. So we need to uh, really lift that up. Um, she's doing really well. They were down there at CHOP on uh, Wednesday, was it? So they were down at CHOP and got good reports. Uh, and then they set up the October 3rd for the, the doing the front. Um, so we want to pray about that. Um, Steve's going to give us an update on winter blasts. Sure. Well, as you all know, I work at uh, Streamside Camp. Um, we have our own program that we do, you know, once a year called Winter Blast for children from 7 to 17. You know, it's like 8 to 17. And, uh, and it's really a great weekend. Kids, mostly kids from Philly. Um, some kids from New York. Angel Tree kids that we know from Prison Fellowship. And we, we had, so we had about 85 uh, children represented with about 20 counselors um, and our staff. We, it's a nice group of people. We really had a good weekend. Um, the kids were blessed. They had fun. The snow was just right. We had made snow on the hill. And, uh, and, and then we had um, three, um, three speakers that brought five topics. We thought, well, that's a lot of teaching. But it worked out really well, um, you know, with talking about um, you know, how to defend the gospel, how to, is Jesus the only way, uh, topics like that. Um, and the kids needed to know these things. You know, we found, we were trying to get to the, to the core. What is the gospel? You know, we asked the kids that and they, very few of them can even define what the gospel is, you know. And so we, um, we really hit that hard in the teaching. A lot of kids were, were, were very um, convinced of, about some of the things we were talking about. So we had a really good weekend for the Lord. Thanks for praying for us. Thanks, Steve, for that update. Uh, just want to give you a few uh, announcements. Uh, the men's discipleship group, uh, see Pastor JJ if you are interested in that. Online service this evening at 6.30. Uh, focus uh, at 6.30 on Thursday. Um, and then Erica is going to be having her birthday tomorrow. So... Um, uh, if she uh, is she coming today or she's planning she's hoping to so if she gets here give her a happy birthday and then there are uh, new daily breads in the back so if you use the daily bread we'd encourage you uh, to pick um, one up one last announcement um, there are needs different needs in the church and we want everyone to be able to serve so we're not telling you to serve, but we're asking you to serve. And I'll give a very, very short devotional on that in a moment. Uh, but one of the specific needs that we need to announce is we need some accounting help. We want to thank uh, Julie and Kathy for getting, you know, how you got your receipts out at the end of the year. That takes a lot of time, a lot of effort to do. Um, but there's a lot of did things like that, that we need some accounting help. So you do not have to be a member, um, but we, uh, if you want to serve the Lord in that way, uh, please see me or Pastor JJ, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about that with you. At this time, uh, Pastor JJ, Ruthie, Steve, lead us in worship.
earlier mentioned, uh, we're looking for help uh, in particularly the area of accounting in the church, um, as well as many other areas. Uh, if you want to help with children's ministry, Kathy's there. Uh, there's other things that um, our needs in the church. We're starting a discipleship group, things like that. Uh, so if you're I interested in helping, please see one of us. We want you to be serving the Lord. And uh, if it's here, wherever, however uh, the Lord calls you to serve, uh, we want to be able to help you as a church. Um, there are uh, two lists of qualifications for elders and deacons given in uh, 1 Timothy 3 and Titus. Uh, the term overseer or bishop is used. They're synonymous terms with elder, bishop, overseer, shepherd. Um, but uh, there's a part of that list that we often miss. And I just wanted to bring it to our attention very quickly today. Um, I don't want to take away from Pastor JJ's speaking time, <laughs> preaching time. But I, I think it's really important in the spirit in which we serve. And it's speaking of the elder, or it says here, bishop in the New King James. This is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of bishop or elder, he desires a good work. Notice there's two words that are used repeated there, two similar words. If he desires it, it's a good work he what? Desires. And you know, the first question I ask if somebody wants to be an elder or a deacon, one of the first questions I ask, is this something you desire? We're not asking for somebody to come forward and help with accounting who doesn't desire to do that in service to the Lord. But we hope that we're working on our desires and considering how are we desiring. I have a lot of notes. I'll skip most of them. Um, but the, wor the one word for desire means to reach toward, having this heart reaching toward. The, the other word for desire means to yearn for, to long for. Are, are we reaching for and longing for how to serve the Lord? And so I thought that would be a good way to start our prayer time today is to think about how are we serving? How are we desiring to serve the Lord? Let's pray. Father, thank you for this opportunity to, to bring before you the prayer needs of the church. And we bring the prayer need of somebody to help with accounting work in the church. Um, we pray that uh, you would supply that need. And we thank you for Julie and, and Kathy's uh, work toward that this past year. Uh, just pray to, that you would continue to help them. Uh, we, we pray also, Lord, that uh, whatever we do, that we would do with a heart and a desire to serve you. Uh, we think of now as we come and pray for the offering, we thank you for those who have given as service to you. Uh, we pray for uh, you to raise up other areas where people have a desire to serve. Uh, Lord, we, we lift up the other needs in the church. We pray particularly for Amanda and Paul as uh, they consider going down to Texas for Gretchen's funeral service this week. And just pray that you would give them direction and wisdom. And, and, and we just pray that you would comfort particularly Amanda during this time uh, after losing her sister. Uh, Father, we continue to pray for Kenny and we pray for uh, continued healing uh, in his eye and the bone area. And thank you that uh, the surgery seemed to, to go very well. Uh, Father, we lift up Harold Portfield particularly, and Becky also have had COVID, and pray that Harold would be able to get better nights of sleep and just uh, protect him in this time. And Lord, we, we particularly lift up Vera and pray that uh, she would continue to help, um, heal well from her uh, last surgery, as well as we just... Uh, commit uh, this next surgery on October 3rd to you and pray for your protection over her. Lord, we thank you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. There is a hill I cherish where stood a fresh Oh, 
crowns before the Lord. Let this be my confession. My wealth is in the cross. My wealth is in the cross. There's nothing more I want than just to know His love. My heart is set on Christ, and I will count all of time's loss. The greatest of my crowns means nothing to me now.
If your Bible is turned to Luke chapter 12, Luke chapter 12. Well, good morning. Luke chapter 12. We're going to be looking at our series that we've been continuing to look at. Uh, I actually haven't preached for a little bit with, with uh, Vera surgery and everything. Dad, thanks for uh, helping me out during that time and everything with preaching and everything. But I'm looking forward to kind of get back uh, to a series that I've been looking at through Luke chapter 12. And today we're going to be looking at this phrase, you are more valuable. And I do want to remind us where we've kind of come from. Uh, where we talked about how uh, nothing that's hidden will be, uh, 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 that won't be revealed. Uh, there's nothing that's hidden that won't be revealed. Verse 4, Jesus says, hey, don't fear those who can kill the body, but do nothing more. Fear the one who can kill body and soul. Fear the Lord, in other words. And that leads us now to our text in verse 6. And we're going to be looking specifically today at verse 6 and 7. It says this, chapter 12 of Luke, verse 6. Are not five sparrows sold for two cents? Yet not one of them is, for, is forgotten before God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear. You are more valuable than many sparrows. Let's pray. Father, as we consider your word today and as we consider the sparrows... And the number of hairs on our head, as we consider, Father, what you say here, what Jesus says, that we are more valuable. Help us to understand this. Lord, I pray that it would impact our hearts and our souls today. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, if I were to say to you before the service was to start, that the pastor is going to give an illustration of a good deal. I'm sure that you would assume that dad's the one giving the sermon. He likes to talk about the good deals that he finds. I found a good deal. Found a good deal. A very different deal uh, than maybe what he finds, but I found something that was good for me. I have a weird little thing. I, I, I don't understand this exactly, but it helps me. I get the most work done when I am in a place filled with strangers that are not talking to me. For whatever reason... I get a lot of work done when I am on my computer and there's action happening around me and people are over there talking and this is going on and I, I do well with that. I don't know why. Most people are like, give me space, let me be by myself and I can focus. I'm not like that. I need to be around people. And what I found is that, man, if I go to, say, a diner, I get so much work done at that diner <laughs> than if I were to be all by myself or in my house or something along, along those lines. I get far more work done there. So I've always kind of tried to find places uh, that I could go. Well, COVID hit, right? So Dunkin' Donuts was kind of taken away. I used to go to Dunkin' Donuts and get a lot of work done there. And ever since I've been going to diners, and just to be honest, it's, it's getting pricey. It's getting pricey, right? Uh, if you go to a diner each time you want to do some work, that starts adding up. Well, uh, this week I was uh, out with a friend today uh, on, on Thursday, and we went to Panera Bread. And I noticed on the table that there was this sign. It said, unlimited coffee <laughs> for $9 for a full month. And I said, wow, that's pretty cool. The more I looked into it, the more I found out that they give you three months free of coffee. The first three months are completely free. So I started saying, well, you know, if I go to a diner, one sitting at a diner is going to cost me at least $10, unlimited coffee for, for 10 bucks, and I can go to Panera Bread anytime I want. Where, and by the way, people do that at Panera Bread. They, they said, this is not an ad for Panera Bread. I'm just saying, I found a really good deal. And so I, I ended up getting that, and I, uh, on Friday, I spent the majority of the day at Panera Bread. And let me tell you, I got a lot of work done. <laughs> and to me, I looked at that, I said, wow, that was a great deal. And it's interesting because as we start today in our sermon, we're going to look at three different points. We're going to look at the sparrows. We're going to look at the hairs of your head. And then we're going to look at your value. And so a great deal is good to find. And it's interesting that when we start looking at sparrows, we first of all see this immediate comparison between God's authority over man and then also 
his care for us. So remember the previous verses, fear God. He can set, he's the one who can cast body and soul into hell. And that follows up with God cares for you. You're more valuable than the sparrows. Isn't that interesting? If anyone was concerned about, oh, God can cast into hell, that's concerning. He follows up by, but no, I care for you. We see uh, uh, Guzik say this. He says, Matthew chapter 10, verse 29, which you can look up that scripture, tells us that one could buy two sparrows for one copper. Here we learn that five sparrows cost two coins. Well, that's a pretty good deal. We need to understand, first of all, how small of a amount this is. This is one of the lowest denominations. We're talking pennies here. Okay? I don't know what you can buy for pennies these days, but it's not much, right? <laughs> We're talking about the lowest denom one of the lowest denominations that there are. And not only is it the lowest de denomination, but the, spar the sparrows, according to Matthew, can be sold. Buy one, get one free. <laughs> Buy one sparrow for a penny and get one free. That's what it is. Lowest denomination, and not even that, not even one sparrow is worth one of these denominations, right? Mm -hmm. Then we learn in our text, it's actually, you can buy two and get three free. It's even a better deal. If you get more of them, you can even get three free if you just buy two. Well, that's a pretty good deal, right? This denomination that we see is not used in the scripture except in regards uh, to this passage right here. It's not even talked about. If we're going to talk about, you know, actual reasonable denominations, we're going to talk about a denarii or something along those lines. We're not even talking about that. We're talking about something so small, so low, so cheap, right? Clark says this, he says, it's used among them to express a thing of the lowest, uh, of the lowest or almost no value. <coughs> and this is now and going to be in comparison to the worth of our souls. If God cares for something that is so small, so lowly, that sparrow, which is worth barely anything. If he cares for that, you can bet that he cares for you. If he remembers the sparrow, and by the way, Matthew talks about God even knows and, could, and, and is in control to me of when they fall. If God is in control and knows those things about something that's so of little value, then you can know and guarantee he cares for you. Now, before we continue, I do want to make this point. This sermon can be thought to be a feel-good sermon. We're talking about God's care for us. What a wonderful thing. And that's absolutely true. We're talking about how to God we are a value. But I want to point out that it's not so much about your value. It's more about how God cares. Sometimes we can take a sermon like this and say, oh, see, I'm of great value. Well, no, actually, we're not of great value. But God has placed value on us. And we'll talk about that as we get into our third point. But I want to point out that it's not so much about how great you are. It's really about the care of God. That he says, I have placed value in you. Anything you are, by the way, comes from God. He's the one that created, right? So it's not like we have anything of our own selves. So don't misunderstand this to be a pumping up of ourselves that, wow, look at us. We're so great. That's not the point here. The point is to say, wow, God cares. The focus is God. God knows all things, let alone the issue of him remembering us. And yet there are many times where you might feel forgotten by God. Here we are reminded that though we may feel alone, God has not forgotten you. In the text it says, yet not one of them is forgotten before God. And again, remember, this is a comparison. If God remembers the sparrows, he certainly will remember you. Guzik says this, he says, if God remembers the sparrow, he will not forget you. So don't lose heart. There are few things worse than the sense of being forgotten. Jesus assured every believer that their life was precious and remembered before God. And it means so much to have someone remember you, to take thought of you. 
and maybe we wish that people in our lives would would think of us a little bit more or remember us a little bit more. But the one thing we can know is God doesn't forget you. Valentine's Day just happened. I know Dad was given some illustrations about flowers and Valentine's Day. You know, I didn't get flowers, but I did get chocolates for Rachel, right? And uh, one thing we decided, we got a huge box of chocolates, and uh, it was very big. Uh, and uh, we said, we're going to have just one chocolate a day together. And, uh, and so we made that thing last. And it's interesting, you know, Valentine's Day is nice, but what happened if dad, and this is dad's illustration in some ways, but what would happen if I gave something to my wife and said, hey, I love you, I care for you so much, it's Valentine's Day, I want to really care for you, but all the other days I don't care for you. That would be awful, wouldn't it? That would be awful. And the fact of the matter is it's not just one day. Every day we need to care for our spouses, right? And every day God cares for you. God cares for you. Clark says, man distrusts God and fears that he is forgotten by him because he judges of God by himself. And he knows that he is apt to forget his maker and be unfaithful to him. And I thought that was an interesting point that Clark makes. Sometimes we worry about God forgetting us, not because we see God accurately. God's not forgetting you. But we see it from our perspective. Well, I forget. <laughs> How often do we forget the Lord? How often do we forget the people that we care about and love? I've been in multiple situations where I thought, oh, I probably should have remembered that and cared for this person in that situation. We're apt to forget. God doesn't forget. He remembers. And though we are prone to forget, he is faithful to not forget his promises, to not forget his love, to not even forget his children. And you can know that God does not forget you. In the text in Matthew chapter 10, verse 29, which we're not necessarily turning there, but it's the, it's the cross reference to this passage. It's the same story, but said in a little bit different way. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 29, it talks about how not one of them fall to the ground from your father. God is aware and in control of every sparrow that falls. Is he not in control and over our lives as well? If he's so thoughtful and mindful of the sparrow, even to the fact that the, no sparrow can fall without God, then is he not in control of our lives too? So with that in mind, I have three thoughts in regards to the thoughts of God toward me are. And I'm, I just pointed this out, man. I, I, I love going to Psalm 139. because Maybe I, I can overdo it sometimes, and I apologize for that. But man, what a powerful psalm, right? And I just wanted to point it out in Psalm 139. As it talks about our lives and how precious his thoughts are of us. How precious are the thoughts to me, O oh God. How vast is the sum of them. If I should count your thoughts of me, they would outnumber the sand. When I awake, I'm still with thee. There's so much power there. And I just wanted to say about as, as God does not forget the sparrow. He remembers you and his thoughts of you or toward me are, first of all, they're precious. Just as Psalms 139 says, God's thoughts toward you and I, they should be precious to us. He loves you and cares for you so much. And his thoughts of you outnumber the sand of the sea. What an incredible thing. They are vast in number. Not only are they precious, but there's so many. I've gone to a few beaches. I've never even tried to count a handful of sand, right? I've never even tried that. The idea that's being placed here in Psalms 139 is that they far outnumber the sand of the sea. What an incredible thing. Thirdly, God's thoughts of you are always there. He's not forgetting you. There might be times and moments where you feel forgotten. There might be times and moments where you say, God, where are you here? The psalmist even goes in Psalm, uh, in Psalm 13, how long will you forget? But we know that God ultimately does not forget. We may feel that, but he remembers. The second illustration that is given is that of hair. And we see that in verse 
uh, 7. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are numbered. Now, I don't know uh, that many of us know how many hairs are on your head. This is a detail that I'm sure you don't even know. Maybe some of you who might shave your heads or uh, be balding or something along those lines, maybe you can say, hey, I, I can figure out my hairs a little bit easier. Fair enough, fair enough. But the fact of the matter is, the point that is being made is that we, don't, we can't even know that number for ourselves. Anyone sit there and count their hairs? I don't think so, right? Now, Guzik said this. I don't know where Guzik got this. I don't know if it's accurate or not, but it was the only statistical aspect that I found, so I thought I'd share it with you. Uh, Guzik said it has been said that a redhead has about 9,000 hairs. A dark-haired person has about 120,000 uh, hairs. A blonde has about 145,000 hairs. Yet God knows exactly how many hairs you have. Now, I don't know where Guzik got that statistic or that idea. Wherever he got it, even if it's remotely right, the fact that the matter is the numbers of your hair change on a daily basis you brush your hair you're miss you you've lost hair in the brush right you see what i'm saying the number of your hair has changed for those of you that have gotten older maybe you're losing some hair right you say hey well when i was younger i had much more hair i don't have as much hair anymore right that number is constantly changing it's not a stagnant number I mean, can you imagine trying to do just a spreadsheet throughout your life of the number of hairs that you've had at every moment of your life? Can you imagine what kind of spreadsheet that would be? It's ridiculous, right? And yet, as it talks about God, God has numbered them all. Every single one. We haven't even taken the time to number our own even once. He knows it all the time. He is that invested in you and I. That's not because we're great again. That's not because we're anything special. It's because of God's care. How much he cares. Barnes says this, He has fixed the number, and though of small importance, yet he does not think it beneath him to determine how few or how many there shall be. He will therefore take care of you. He is so intimately acquainted with you that he knows the details of the most smallest of, of importance. And you can bet, you can know that he knows the other things of greater importance too. If he knows the very number of your hair, the hairs of your head, you can know he cares for the other things as well. When you care about something, you want to look into it. You want to go deeper into it. I find that what happens with me when I see a movie or something that I really impresses me. I start looking deeper into it. Oh, well, how did they make this? Oh, well, what did they say? What are the interviews by the actors or something like that? You want to get to know it more intimately. And then you can sit there and talk about a movie. And I can sit there and rattle off meaningless, purposeless facts about this movie that you really don't care about. But I cared about it because I looked into it, right? When you care about something, you look into it. You pursue it. Guzik says, yet God knows exactly how many hairs you have. If he knows that about you, he knows all the important things. He knows everything about you. He knows your body, your needs, your future. He knows about your dreams and your hurts, your desires. He knows about your sorrows and your struggles. He knows about your sin your scars. He knows your very thoughts, as Psalm 139 says, and on and on. And by the way, he's the one that made you. He put the time and effort to design you. He knows you completely, down to the very number of hairs on your head. So with that in mind, God being intimately acquainted with all of me means, first of all, man, he searches, he investigates, he, 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 is, he is diving into this aspect of who we are, even by very holding our very fibers together. He searches you, as Psalm 139 also talks about. Secondly, he knows. Have you ever had that moment and just being like, Lord, I... I feel at a loss. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. You can just know in that moment, he knows. 
He cares. God being intimately acquainted with all of me means He cares. Can you just let that sink in for just a moment? It's not because of anything you've done. It's not because of how great you are. But just let the sink in for a moment. He so cares for you. He cares for you. That leads us to our third point. Valuable. You don't need to be afraid, as it says in verse 7. Do not fear. You are more valuable than many sparrows. Than many sparrows. Barnes says this, the argument is that if he takes care of the birds of the least value, if he regards so small a thing as the hair of the head and numbers it, he will certainly protect and provide for you. You need not, therefore, fear what man can do. Remember our context, right? Jesus said, don't be afraid of those that can kill the body and do no more. Fear God, right? God cares for you. And therefore, we don't have to fear what man can do because we have a God who cares for us. We have a God who's more in control, who is in charge of the body and the soul, not just the body, right? And therefore, we don't need to be afraid. By the way, isn't it interesting that this word fear is the same word for fear that we see in the previous verses? When it says in uh, verse 4, my friends, do not be afraid of those who can kill the body, after that they can do no more. Verse five. But I will warn you, fear whom I will warn you who to fear. Fear the one who has killed and has authority to cast in hell into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Same words in the same context here. Fear God, but don't be afraid. Don't fear what man can do. Guzik says this, he says, those who are persecuted are tempted to give in to the feeling that they are worthless and that no one cares for them. Yet a loving God in heaven values each one. Do not put your worth in what man says. Put your worth into who God says you are. Now, there's lots of things that God says, that we were enemies of God, that we're sinners, that we had a sin issue, right? But we're also made in the image of God, and then Christ redeems us from our sin. And now he says, you're children of God, I love you, I care for you, because your sin has been able to be removed because of the love of Jesus for us. We are worth value, not because we were great. We're of value because he has placed value on us. Clark says this, he says, everything is continually under the government and care of God, and nothing occurs without his will or permission. If then he regards sparrows, how much more man, and how much more still the soul that trusts in him. You know, it's interesting, because in the same chapter that our text is in, in verse 24, Jesus again talks about birds. And in verse 24, this is what he says. He says, consider the ravens, not the sparrows, but the ravens now. For they, they neither sow nor reap. They have no storeroom or, nor barn, and yet God feeds them. How much more valuable you are than the birds. You see, Jesus is even done with this point that he makes in our text. He's going to come back to it and say, not only does God care about the sparrows, and if they fall, God also cares for the ravens, and he makes sure that they're fed. They don't have to store in the barns. He feeds them. Why? Because you are valuable. They're valuable to him. Therefore, you are valuable to God. Now, I can understand something, and I wanted to address this a little bit. There might be pushback here to some degree for some especially for those that are of the world. Uh, even Christians, I think, can struggle with this. Well, if God cares for me so much, and he is so powerful, why would God allow, you fill in the blank, this to happen in my life? If he really cares, why would he allow this? Now, to answer that question, I have to first say, I can't. <laughs> Because I'm not God. I don't know the why. And God doesn't spell out the why within the word of God all the time. 
There are things that are mysteries to us that ultimately we can't always know the why. But this is what we can know. And this is what I would like to put forth to us. What we do know is that God sees the bigger picture. He knows ultimately what is best, best for you. He has a plan and a purpose for what he is doing. And he meets you in the midst of your pain, in the midst of the difficult things that happen. God did not protect his own son from pain, did he? He allowed his son to be tortured, to be beaten, to be betrayed, to grieve and to sorrow. God allowed that for his very own son. Why would we think that God would stop pain and suffering from us? If he allows his own son to go through that, and he allowed his own son to go that for a purpose. So the fact of the matter is that bad things happen is not proof that God does not care. Because he allows himself to go through pain, he also wants us to endure the sufferings of Christ as well. How much more does God care for the suffering child? If he cares for the very sparrows that fall, then you can know that even in the midst of your suffering. God cares for you. He loves you dearly. And even when we go through that suffering, let that be something we can cling to. Because you know what? Our circumstances don't change one one way or another. You can sit there and be mad at God, uh, because why did you allow this to happen? But you're still going through it, aren't you? You have a God that says, man, I want to meet you in your sorrow. I want to care for you in what you're going through. I want you to know I love you in this moment. I want to wrap my arms, figuratively, obviously, wrap my arms around you because I love you, my daughter, my son. Let me tell you, that comfort is so much more easier to go through the pains that we go through in our lives when we know that God is there and he cares for us. So the fact that bad things happen is not a proof to say that God doesn't care. He himself experiences pain. And we will go through pain. But he promises to be with you in the midst of pain. If the sparrows are given a value, small as it though, though it may be, one of the questions is, well, what is the value of the soul? Clark says this. He says, none can estimate the value of a soul. For which Christ has given his blood and life. Have confidence in his goodness. For he who so dearly purchased thee will miraculously preserve and save thee. You see, sin has a dear cost, does it not, folks? Yet it was a cost that the Father and the Son chose to experience and go through. Because they loved Consider at this moment the value that God places on you while you were enemies, while you had nothing to offer, while you are of no intrinsic value, yet God says, I'm willing to send my son to die because I love you. Consider the completely undeserved Things that Jesus went through. That God would allow his son to go through. To be betrayed and beaten and mocked and tortured. So that you could be bought back with a price for your sins. God has placed the value. And the value was at the cost of his own son. That's how much God values us. Is that not stunning and amazing for us today? To consider. If he values the sparrows. He values you. And he proved that he valued you. To the point where Jesus gave his life. The king of all glory. The creator of all things. The great and all powerful God. Deeply cares. For you. So with that in mind. I have three questions and application for us to close in. And the first is this. 
How does the care and power of God comfort me when I'm afraid? Jesus says, don't fear. Don't fear. You're more valuable than the sparrows. He is in control of when they fall. He remembers them and does not forget them. If God does that, then how does the care and the power of God impact me in the times that I might feel afraid? Secondly, how can I grow in caring for my God who cares for me so perfectly? You know, this is a give and take relationship, isn't it? Right? We want to love God. He has so loved us. Let us love him too. I think it's so unfortunate for the person that says, oh yeah, God loves me, but I'm going to live my life on my own, by myself, the way I want to live it because it's about me. Right? Isn't that a problem? If we realize how much God loves us and sacrificed for us and went through pain and suffering and all the things that he went to, then should that make us say, God, I want to love you. You've loved me so much. I want to love you back. How are we doing that today? How does God want us to love him? And finally, and thirdly, why would God value me? I told you at the very beginning of the sermon, this sermon is more about God and his care and less about me. So when I ask this question, it's easy to take this question and say, oh, why would God value me? I have done this or I've done that. That's not the point of the question. My question is, why would God? Why would God value? There's so many answers to that. Because he is good. Because he is loving. Because he is gracious. Because he is forgiving. Because he's merciful. We could go on and on and talk about those things. But it's not because of my value and me being that much worth of anything. It's because God has placed value on us. So this question isn't about to reflect on myself and what I have done. This question is to get us to think about how great our God is. That he would place value on me. Folks, I know this. Apart from Christ, I am worthless. The only thing that gives me value is God. You might say, well, we're created in the image of God, so we have intrinsic worth. Again, that comes from God, does it not? Anything I have is because of God. So that question is intended to make us think on the character and the goodness and the greatness of God. And with that, let's close in prayer. Father, we do come to you today, and we want to thank you for caring for us, Father, for remembering us. Though we ultimately have nothing to offer of our own, Lord, you have loved us. You have sent your Son, that your Son was willing to die so that we could be redeemed, bought back with a price. Lord, we thank you that though we know we have not much to offer and value, Lord, that you have valued us anyway. That's not because of us. It's because of how great you are. Thank you that you so love the world. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Praise him and thank him for his wonderful care and love for us. Have a great day and Lord bless you.